For primitive man, there is no poetic language, for his language is already in itself a natural poem where dwells the value of words. And while I have spoken of the song of the Gayaki as an aggression against language, it should henceforth be understood as the shelter that protects him. But it is still possible to hear from wretched, wandering savages the all too strong lesson concerning the proper use of language, such as the life of the Gayaki Indians. By day, they walk together through the forest, women and men, the bow in front, the basket behind. The coming of night separates them, each one surrendering to his dream. The women sleep and the hunters sometimes sing alone. Pagans and barbarians, only death saves them from the rest. The very rules of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. As always, we are sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we get started today and commence our discussion of Pierre Claster's 1974 book, Society Against the State, which we're covering Copernicus and the Savages, Exchange and Power, The Bow in the Basket, The Do to Speak of Torture in Primitive Societies, and the titular essay, Society Against the State. Just want to let you guys know that we have a Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Drop us a buck. We could always use your support. Shoot us a review on iTunes as well. It definitely yeah. helps out. If you can't, you know, times are hard. You might not be able to spare a buck, but definitely help out on the reviews on YouTube. We had some people like screw with us and give us like a one and a three. So that'd be awesome if somebody could help uh, balance that out. Flood the reviews, game the system. Your quote that we have headlining the the show today is from the end of The Bow in the Basket, which the Liz and Guattari quote from Anti-Oedipus. What's good to know about these essays, even though the book was published in 74, it's really pretty much as one of his like most well-known books and also most critiqued. The essays span from 61 to 73. I think Exchange in Power is the earliest from 61. And the bow in the basket, although he, they cite in anti Oedipus the bow in the basket and of torture and primitive societies. And I think an earlier version of the second essay appeared in 72 because Deleuze and Guattari cite some of the I think he might have included it in his first book, some of, some of that work. And in 74, he reworks that for this essay because anti Oedipus cites the same lines that you'll see in this essay, which he actually like cites them back. So there's a kind of interesting like interplay. Yeah, between... I was curious as to how that worked because I was like, oh man, this feels like Deleuze and Guattari highly like influenced by, or <laughs> one way or another, like there's a big, influence here going on of course sort of reciprocal right some type of a conjunctive synthesis maybe yeah i mean they they draw upon his work not only anti oedipus but also in a thousand plateaus where they give him a kind of gentle critique in a thousand plateaus yes in a thousand plateaus they both have a tribute to his work Mm -hmm. in the um in the war machine plateau which they are very kind to they actually say like this is in memory of claster who passed away in 76 at the age of i believe he was 42 or 43 he was in a car accident you know i was talking to someone earlier one of our mutuals about the critiques of claster and right. how you know being so young i mean i still think 42 43 is pretty young especially in the life of a thinker who could live to be 70 plus yeah or levy strauss lived to be fucking 99 100 so who knows uh, that he's, you know, still, if his first book is 72 and he dies in 76, like he's, 
he's really just getting started on his yeah, trajectory. Exactly. So, which is sad. Yeah. So it was hard to, you know, it's hard. It's, it, it's interesting to see where he would have gone and how he would have developed and changed because already you can see in like the exchange of power essay, he's moving away from a kind of structuralism, you know, in the sixties, that's kind of what was being done. Right. Structuralism right. was both being adopted and quickly being overturned. In any case, in the second mention of clusters in a thousand plateaus in the uh, apparatus of capture plateau, they again kind of say that the merit of clusters' work is this argument of, against evolutionism, and we see some of this language in the essays we went over because you know he's he's kind of making this point that there is this ethnocentric bias to think of primitive societies as like embryonic, as though with enough linear time chronologically right. given enough time they would evolve to societies with the state and he kind of says in the titular essay that perhaps two things could lead to the evolution of the state but it's discontinuous and it's not necessarily chronological one being the a demographic question but the demographic question of you know because for him necessarily primitive societies are in terms of size course. Or, or, yeah, are, are numerically small. Right. Okay. A, and and where there are exceptions to that rule, you can see some of the seeds of power beginning to develop in the chieftainship. But he links that demographic question, which he says that ethnology alone can't solve, to this question of prophetic speech, which I know we'll get into. So it becomes for Claster like this conjunction or even competition between the prophet and the chieftain and whose speech will elicit the uh, the kind of equilibrium of society because the prophet is seeking a kind of disequilibrium of saying we've got to go out and seek a promised land and this religious discourse is high is, is much different than is a much is it's well if the chief chiefs discourse has a religious tone it's about kind of like Here's how the ancestors live. We want to live in harmony like they did. Mm -hmm. Whereas the prophets are offering this quasi utopian vision that, that breaks with the, the status quo. But sadly in this book, at least classes doesn't really go into, into that more. And what Deleuze and Guattari say is, even though classes work, the merit of it is to fight against a certain evolutionism that thinks that one could just, you know, if just primitive societies incubated a little bit more, they would grow and be adult civil societies like we have. And throughout, you know, the and Guattari's work, there is this fight against that kind of naive historicism. They still say that when ethnology kind of pits itself in its own territory and doesn't include the map of archaeology on top of its map or with its map, then it becomes a kind of idealism. So that's kind of their, their critique in, eight, in 1980 of Classer's work. But at the same time, they obviously owe, I think, a, a great debt to him. Oh, yeah. And, that's, yeah. and, that's, and, and, and honestly, all of that intro that we're giving is kind of telling the audience why we are taking this detour through Claster's work in order to come back to anti-Oedipus with some of these, uh, some of these nuggets, these knowledge nuggets. Just to share briefly from my perspective as someone coming to the text, at least anti-Oedipus kind of with new eyes, I think is that this book is, I think, invaluable in, I think really in particular understanding Guattari, but overall, like in the kind of movements that are taking place within not only anti-Oedipus, but libidinal economy and symbolic exchange and death, as well as there's Lacan. So this is kind of even like suturing together or quilting a lot of these kind of different strands we're going through, because I think here, at least in one of the essays, and I forget which one, you could probably name it off the top of your head, but I mean, there's some stuff relative to sexuation and the non-sexual relation, I think, or like the, the graph of sexuation relative yeah. to these examples that Clasters gives of the different statuses of the different males, the, the pane, and how that differentiates across two examples, one being the homosexual and the other being this sort of 
the man who is not a man, but not a woman. He's in this yeah. indeterminate state because he's lost. He's the curse of the Pane or whatever has been yes. inscribed upon him, let's say. And so he is in a sort of mode of indeterminacy and he doesn't really fit into the sort of, I guess, the, the place of the man or the place of the woman within Giyaki society. And right. As that wild card is sort of a threat to the stability or. Yeah, the. This is, I think it's good to start here and we can, we can, so we're actually, I mean, we can back up because I think that, no, I mean, I, I think this you, is great. I think this is great. This is from the bow in the basket. And even that title is describing the, the sexual division of labor. The bow would be as he details, right? When the young, when a boy is born at the age of five or six, his father makes him a little bow. Right. So he can practice by the time, you know, he's eight or nine and gets a slightly larger bow and he's able to he goes out and, and kills birds and brings it back to his mother as a kind of show that he is becoming a successful hunter. And by the age of 15, he gets to make his own bow. And what Cooper was talking about just now about the Pane is what the the Garani call the curse. There's this fear there's a prohibition about bows and baskets because the girl the the young girls of the society do the same thing they get up they get a basket that's made for them by the time they start menstruating they weave their own basket and they carry that around because they are the ones that are mainly preparing meals whereas the men are going out in the forest at night to hunt right and so the the curse of pane is literally like bad luck in hunting and it can come from a number of ways the curse could come from a man touching a woman's basket that could get you bad luck it could come from a woman touching the man's bow and there's there's equal prohibitions on each side where the man would be too ashamed to to touch a woman's basket while the woman would be too afraid right that i don't know that she would have to perhaps become a man. And what Clasters is describing with the two examples that Coop gave, these two asymmetrical examples, one is, as Coop said, a, a homosexual, literally a, a sodomite, wears his, as Clasters calls him, wears his hair longer. He engages in a kind of becoming woman. And Clasters right. actually uses that phraseology, which is interesting because it's really in a thousand plateaus six years later that that phrase will, will take on a lot more weight. But, uh, but Clasters describes how this this one man has basically given up his manhood and is completely accepted by the tribe. He's taken up a basket of his own. He's seeing, he, well, he, he participates in the choral singing of the women, the plaintive singing, and he lies with other men if they so choose, which Claster says this interesting phrase that, the, that men will choose him as a sexual partner, not out of perversion, but out of bodiness. That yeah. was an interesting way of phrasing it because kind of like in the ancient Greeks, right? If, if this man has become woman mm -hmm. and is actively living with them and participating in all the activities of the women, then effectively he is a, he is a woman, right? So in any case, he doesn't have his own bow. He's given up all of the manner because really the symbol, the phallus, if you will, of the right. man is the bow. It is the means by which they gain prestige and hunting, all this stuff. But the other man, basically, he's a widower and he's basically given up his bow because he has effectively been affected by this curse, right? This curse of Pane. And so he, while he lives with the woman, his life is a lot more anxious because right. his becoming woman is, is asymmetrical. He's not a quote unquote sodomite, his becoming woman is a more uh, stressful, if you will. It's not something that he necessarily chose out of being what um, Classer calls an unconscious invert, you know, using the language of psychoanalysis at the time. He's, he's given up his bow because he's not any good at killing game. The only game he gets is with his bare hands. What was it? It was like armadillos, armadillos yeah. and, and some other animals that he might be able to, to chase down. So the men make fun of him. The children don't respect him and the women kind of put up with him, but he doesn't have his own basket, right? He's kind of this anomaly, 
Right. And Clashers includes these two examples of becoming woman to kind of show as the exception to the rule that the man and the woman both have their own respective phalluses, if you will, right? right. The basket yeah, for yeah, women, yeah, exactly. the, the, the bow for men. And one of the things that's so, one of the reasons why there's the prohibition and why there's the fear behind it of pawne, of bad luck at hunting, is that kind of like, I mean, what Claster shows in The Bow in the Basket in that essay is that the incest prohibition isn't really even the most interesting prohibition. It's the fact that the, pro, the, the first prohibition is specifically you can't eat your own kill. Okay. Right, yeah. The first thing you do when you say you kill a deer or whatever, a fowl, a game bird, the examples he doesn't really give, but we can just imagine whatever animals they would hunt in the forest, you bring that back, you give some to your wife to cook of which you don't eat. Right. But then you also distribute it to the rest of society. And, you know, basically there's this bond of the men hunters that is instituted in this prohibition of eating their own kill. They can't become self-sufficient. So the social ties are, are strengthened and tightened by this prohibition of not eating one's own kill. Anyway, I'll let you uh, take a breath just to let you like, <laughs> work, work in. It's a cool thing because it has this notions of the of Lacan's graph of sexuation, I guess, to put a to make that more apparent. But also, like you said, and exemplified the becoming woman aspect. But yeah, I thought that was quite interesting, especially the way that you articulated that bow and basket as a phallus for each, uh, really setting the stage for that, exemplifying that graph of sexuation that I kind of mentioned. Maybe the most interesting part is maybe a detail that you didn't mention that I thought was kind of interesting too, that the gentleman person that was not, who was more of the ostracized, he's the one that's kind of has this non place yeah. in, in this arrangement would even, he would, so he had his own basket, but the way that he would carry the basket physically was in, oh, the, most okay. Okay. Was in the most challenging fashion. Right. And so it's an interesting way to, I think, think about, that about castration relative to the graph yeah. of sexuation. But, you know, I guess the, I don't know how that would work on the, on the other side of the, of the graph relative to women in the phallus, but you've said, yes, there is the women have their own phallus in the basket, but I don't know without that counter example of, you know what I mean? Or is that just so I, yeah. rare that the reverse, well, I guess women we, can't have the curse, can they? We not at least in the examples we are given, we can easily imagine a woman who somehow, whether pulled a Mulan or did had some sort of uh, way of becoming the exception on the other side of becoming man and taking up a bow, right? Whether she was feral and that like ran from the home, you know, and, and had a bow and, and made arrows in the wild and. You know, we can imagine that example, but we're not given that example. We're not giving the example of the of the woman becoming man and becoming huntress outside of the tribe. He's looking at perhaps right there could there could be those examples. But yeah, and the let's see the we have on the. I'm glad you corrected me because I think that what while the the man who became woman and he's he's actually given credit for being a better artist than the women, which is interesting. The hunters would give him animal teeth so that he could make like the nicest bracelets. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. He's got a, he's got an eye and a skill for that. He's who Claster calls the unconscious invert, the sodomite. Mm -hmm. And his name is Cranbeggy, Cranbeggy. Anyway, I think he, if I read this right, I think he, he weaves his own basket and that's cool. And he, where, and he, and he hauls the basket like the women do, right? He's totally cool with, doing everything they do. Whereas, as you said, the other guy, Chachu Buddha Wachugi, he's given a basket. He doesn't weave his own. He doesn't partake in that artistry. And yeah, you said he wear, he like almost stubbornly refuses to participate yeah. in most of the womanly activities. He doesn't sing with the women. He only sings, as they said, on very special occasions where all men are demanded to sing, which is like at the birth of a child, I think is what Claster says. So, um, you know, he doesn't go off hunting with the other men. He's not taken as a secondary husband, all these things. So yeah, he's kind of a part. And so his existence is much more complicated and anxious for him. 
he's kind of the, the unhappy outcast while still being, well, he's outcast from being taken in from other families or having his own family, right? You know, he really is the kind of exception that proves the rule. It's interesting um, relative to, I yeah. think, specifically castration in the classical psychoanalytic sense. Right. Yeah. He, uh, he became unworthy of wielding the phallus. Right. Right. He, he never was able to prove himself. As far as we know, even though he was a widower, he could remarry or he could become because of uh, because the next thing we have to talk about, too, with terms of sexuality is the fact that due to the demographic ratio of men to women, there being a two to one ratio, there's what they call polyandry, right? That that in this society, the Gayakis, women normally take on two husbands and Claster's reasoning is this, that even if. The primary husband may not like it when the woman, when his wife takes on another husband and kind of, but he has to deal with it because if there were a large number of bachelors who were unmarried, basically Claster's posits that there would be a kind of internal civil war and that that that, that would lead to collective suicide. Which still makes one kind of also begs the question in the sense of why the, it's interesting that the secondary husbands or have not banded together to eliminate some, you know what I mean? In that sense, which I think in a way sort of goes to this whole notion of how power operates within these societies, perhaps the incest prohibition seems to be validated here. Right. And Claster's mentioned this. He says that this is how this is addressed rather than there being, you know, something like a, uh, yeah, like incest being acceptable within the society. Right. So they choose the, or they don't choose it, necessarily but they utilize this strategy right you have the, a yeah. stable society but there is still there's still an enmity between you know there's a jealousy at the at the level of the individual relative on the male side because of the the competition not the competition but i guess the the multiple husbands right so they have to sort of begrudgingly accept this arrangement to have a society but just because it is the sort of I it's guess. the stablest. It's right. the one with the most equilibrium. Even as this stabilizes the society at the level of the individual, it's not all it's cracked up to be in a sense, yeah, at least yeah. for the male, right? At least for the male. And then on the female side, the, the woman will certainly take advantage of their of this. Yeah. So I, I think it, those two things are kind of really interesting given, I guess, anti-Oedipus relative to incest. Also how that sort of jealousy persists at the individual level, but there's a certain acquiescence as well. I think that's kind of an interesting dialectic there. Yeah, I mean, the the way that the husband puts up with the secondary husband, or sometimes as a rule, there's it's normal to have two, there could be three. Sometimes three, right, yeah. Yeah, but basically what we learn is that it's kind of like the status of the chief in primitive societies, as Classer describes it, because the chief is without it is not vested with authority and the ability to command what he's basically doing is going around mediating conflict conflicts yeah 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 okay. and so the husband is kind of in the situation of the chieftain in that he has to show a certain kind of generosity right with yeah, yeah. his uh wife and what what classer kind of logically lays out is that if the primary husband persists in resisting the woman the wife's uh desire to take on another husband she can either leave him or at worst, the the society as a whole will pretty much force him into it and just kind of say, this is the this is the way of our peoples. And so this is the second kind of prohibition where one's kill has to circulate. And, yeah, yeah. you know, you have to take from others from others hunts. Right. So the success of other hunters is just as important as your own success to the health of the society and the strengthening of the social ties. But at the same time, you as a wife taker, you have to leave, you have to have uh, the ability to become a wife giver at the same time, right? So you're taking meat from others, but you're primarily giving your own meat. You're taking wives from others, but you're also leaving the place to to give your wife to another. Right, reciprocity. Or share it. Yeah, that's the reciprocity, that's right. Which goes back to mouse to- Of course. A little um, bit, just to uh, kind of put a flag in that for the listener, because we did cover the gift by mouse, which I think has right. some a certain 
I guess he's coming from the same standpoint, right? An anthropological standpoint as Claster. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that he's looking at different societies. Right. Mouse's focus isn't particularly on the Amer Indians. But though he does reference them, if I don't, but I, but, but I, I'm sure, I'm sure he does. You know, I think that, I think that the description and discussion of the structural relations in terms of prestation and reciprocity and these other things would feel at home for Mousians. Yeah, right. I'm not saying that Claster is using a Mousian framework, but right, he right. does, but it's obviously he's read Mar- uh, Mouse because I don't know if it was the last essay, but in one of the essays he uses the, he puts in scare quotes, total social fact. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that's, I a, that, too. That, that was kind of a Mousian reference. In any case, so you have these two bases of exchange, the exchange of the product of one's kill has to be consumed by someone else. And the quote unquote circulation of wives has to be, has to be left open to a company another and be left open for another. And what what you're saying is very true. This is Claster. This is why Claster begins with the scene of the men singing in the night, because we have two individual prohibitions and restrictions that actually strengthen the collective and the collectivity as a whole. So this is why at the end of the essay. That's kind of interesting relative to social contract theory, but I just wanted to, you can go ahead. I just want to sure, yeah, um, throw that out. At, at the end of the essay, Claster comes back to this image where all the men are gathered at night around the fires and they begin to sing. But unlike the women who sing during the day, whose song is really this kind of lamentation and this, he gives the example of the kill that's come back and the women start to sing this chorus about the dead animal being like a lost son, you know, theirs is a, is a plaint is a, is a complaint. Whereas the men at night are singing and the way they use language is a celebration of language for Claster. And what he says is that even though they seem to be singing together as a chorus, they're actually soloists. Right. They're a group of soloists who are singing. They're, they're not only celebrating language, but they're also celebrating themselves. I got to find the quote that, and this is in Anti-Oedipus as well. Let's see, they say the quote that they have in Anti-Oedipus. I am a great hunter. I am the habit of killing with my arrows. I am a powerful nature, a nature incensed and aggressive, right? So they're, they're like singing these, these songs that as Claster says, is it, putting language to use as an instrument of information or communication, but a celebration. It's like inherently poetic. This gets back to your initial quote. And so what Claster also shows with the bow in the basket, just to wrap everything up, to go back to your stuff about um, sexuation, right? Is that the bow is not just, it's, it's also symbolic of the man's domain. The forest right. is delimited for men, and that is where they they do their primary production, whether it be hunting or burning down, cutting down trees to make room for planting. Whereas the women who cross through the forest in their nomadic, as they move from place to place, that's just a neutral ground. On the other hand, the women, the encampment is the space of women, right? That's where they prepare the meals. That's where they care for the children and some of the other, you know, basic activities of day-to-day life. So you see that there is a delimitation of the territory based on sex as well. One of the most interesting things for the Baudrillard that we've been reading that I thought in the bow in the basket, and then I guess we can leave off from it. Well, I would even say before you get to, before you get to that, I would maybe say pointing out just how I think the songs of the men in the tribe that you just referenced yeah. goes to uh, Guattari's notion of asignifying. And I thought that was a beautiful yes. way to kind of highlight asignification or sort of understand asignification relative to how Guattari is thinking. Yeah. So I thought that was just a really cool way to concretize that concept that I've, you know, I've struggled with. And I think even with, even given this example, it's, I can't quite fully grasp it, but it helps quite a bit to conceive of exactly what Guattari is is referencing when it comes to asignification. He says basically that the singing 
that they do as soloists together is this use of language that's outside of language while celebrating language. Yeah. And he likens it to their only way of kind of venting this frustration that they're doubly constricted on both sides individually right. as husbands and, and as and hunters. All, yeah. And as hunters. Right. So he says on page 122, well, while the relationship of the man to game and to women consists of a disjunction that founds society, his relationship to language condenses in the song into a conjunction that is sufficiently radical to negate precisely language's communicative function and thereby exchange itself. Consequently, the hunter's song assumes a position which is symmetrical to and the reverse of the food taboo and polyandry, and it shows by its form and its content that the men as hunters and husbands want to negate the latter. It's kind of their way of, as I said, kind of venting that this is their right. lot. Or, or to conceive of it as this methodology for keeping the libidinal band from overheating. Yeah, I, that that's, that's exactly, yeah, yeah. As a way of, you know, we said that we've talked about potlatch as a way of virtualizing conflict. I think this may operate in a similar sort of methodology or be a similar methodology for that same sort of consequence for where does that desire channeling flows of desire to in a way that is not threatening to the the band or to the body without organs or something yes and, and sort of thinking out loud there so no and, and, and correct class, if i'm you're totally correct to go back to what you said about guatri and the a signifying i don't know if it's in this essay but precisely this use of language that is not used as an instrument but is used as i said kind of in the spontaneous poetic what he says is it's a transformation of signs into values, which I think is interesting. It's this yeah. value of, of the ego, this value of right. the um, it's this way of treating language in a manner that is both transgressive and yet kind of, as you said, it's a vent for the libidinal band. Right. And I think he uses the phrase, I can't remember if it's an exchange in power, but he uses the phrase de-signification when he's referring to this manner of treating language in this poetic way that is perhaps foreign to our ears, we modern men, right? That in our society, because we think of language in terms of instrumentality, in terms of information, in terms of communication, we can't sense, we don't have the right training or we don't have the right sensitivity to to witness the designification of language that's right. going on when they sing and they it, write. it's kind of like our discussion last week when we were talking about kanye and sort of it looking at okay the what does it mean versus what does it do distinction right, right. relative to his art i think we have this sort of uh, focus on on utility that is sort of ingrained relative, at least relative to communication. And it could be something much wider than that. I don't know. It kind of goes back to, there are no primitive societies. There are merely different methodologies for maintaining a certain equilibrium for the libidinal band. Class just will go a long way in the first essay. And especially in the last essay, the titular essay to push back on the two means of defining archaic societies, right? The lack of writing and what is negatively termed, pejoratively called subsistence economy. And he'll push back on both of those fronts and kind of show how they can be, they need to be defined or reiterated positively, mm -hmm. not in this, not in this negative sense, because he, he even goes so far as to say that defining primitive societies by way of lack of what they're lacking and compared to our societies is nothing but a kind of ethnocentrism that very easily borders on, if not spreads right onto the territory of racism. And so that's kind of what I see is beyond uh, what Elizabeth Guattari said about him combating an evolutionist prejudice. It's also this, the prejudice of defining by way of lack which i think is connected to yeah, yeah. that 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 evolutionist uh prejudice that he sees in 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 ethnology yeah absolutely or political anthropology as he would as he says sometimes one kind of question i thought of and it was just this morning was 
relative to that, as far as speech and writing are concerned. So in the Western tradition, right, it's writing is the more ideal form, right? Yeah, I mean, getting into like Derridean yeah. sort of in the modern mindset, perhaps. Right. Doesn't Derrida's argument is speech is privilege, right? Or no, or written. Well, well that's now see, that's the difference in, in, in Plato, Socrates, writing is an aid to memory and writing a second you know, is, 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 is already, it, it gets back to what we talked about last week. It's already this, this like reflection of a reflection, right? So speech would be in previous times would be the, you know, I think one of the things is like writing doesn't have the author to stand by it, to give it a supplement. This is yeah. kind of what Derrida says, right? Whereas the speaker like Socrates in the dialogue, right. Would be, would be in a privileged position so I think that that would be where in modern day, yeah, we might have the opposite tendency where we might find writing to be somehow more advanced. If we're following Klasser's argument about the definition of archaic societies, societies without writing, societal economies, then yeah, that, that's kind of an ethnocentric thing where writing would be this technology that would set apart our societies and show us to be more advanced. Whereas... The Liz and Guattari show in A Thousand Plateaus and in anti Oedipus specifically, and Claster's kind of works with this notion too, is that writing implies the encounter of different cultures and languages, and therefore also the overcoding of signs, which is ultimately the province of, of states, of despotic machine. So I think that in that sense, writing would be a negative in the sense of the horrors of the state. Whereas we, you know, with the, with a kind of ethnocentric prejudice, we would think of it as a positivity. It's just kind of interesting, the perspective you could take, right? That you could flip it on his head. And I think this is what I was talking to you too about Baudrillard, how he's able to look back and see from our standpoint, these positivities in primitive societies, but then he will also take negatives and point them to us, right? He, he tries to do this in this distorted mirror where no matter how we play it, the primitives come out looking looking great and we come out looking bad in competition. And I think Clasters is, is, isn't is as, uh, I don't know, he's not making the same kind of value judgments, but he is attacking, I think, a common enemy, which I think Baudrillard is also attacking, which, is a, which are these forms of largely unconscious ethnocentrism that creep into anthropological discourse. For Claster, what he says is like, political anthropology and ethology think that they are getting rid of some of these biases by cutting off philosophy, but they really only hide it more in the guise mm-hmm. of science. Yeah. How does my, I mean, and granted, I didn't give this a whole, whole lot of thought, but where would my statement of uh, like reversing this idea that, well, there are, there are no, all societies are primitive, perhaps maybe that, or something like that. Yeah. It would depend on the framework, you know, like if you're if you're working within if we were reworking through libidinal economy, we would we would have a certain line of attack. And part of that is a line of attack against Baudrillard and his sociological background. Right. Which Leotard uh, does reference clusters specifically in sessions yes. when he is discussing Baudrillard. I did check. There's about four. Well, yeah. no, there's actually two textual references in libidinal economy to clusters. But go ahead. I think in terms of anti Oedipus, it becomes a lot more difficult to say that all societies are primitive, primitive insofar as the way that they set forth the primitive territorial machine, the barbaric despotic machine, yeah. and the sort of modern capitalist machine. I think that that's where it would become a little bit, that statement would have to be modified. It's probably better as just sort of a rhetorical thing, right? To just kind of flesh out how these biases or just to kind of reverse, I don't know, there's something illuminating, I think, about reversing that distinction because it's typically only a one-way street. We view ourselves as advanced, but we're not. It's sort of being the, and I don't know, and that rhetorically, it just seems like, it seems like a better rhetorical move to say all societies are primitive. For Clasters, I think with his anarchism, he would say all societies are potentially primitive. The bias you're attacking is this notion that somehow our technological advancement and progress makes us more civilized. Whereas Claster actually tries to articulate how each primitive society 
is as technologically advanced with their tools, with their engagement with the environment as they as they need to be in order to, and this is part two, this is part of his reworking of a positive de- definition of subsistence, where he's like, they've worked out the formula, they've developed the tools and the methods technically to be as advanced as they need to be and right. in order to navigate their milieu and their territory and to gain a surplus. And so like the ethnocentric quasi-racist understanding of subsistence is that every hour of the day is used scouting for food and everyone's starving, everyone's destitute. And Claster's like, no, that's actually completely wrongheaded, that they're actually affluent societies because they have enough food to feed twice their population. How else does population growth happen, right? But also the surpluses that they gained aren't you know, like fucking put into a portfolio and like capital gains and all this other shit. Those surpluses are there in order to be able to do things like potlatch and festivities and, and all the things that we've talked about with Mouse and Baudrillard. For him, he quotes somebody, I forget who it is, but like primitive societies are like the first affluent societies, something like this, right? And the first leisure society is the first affluent society. So that's a that's a positive way of talking about subsistence and technology and saying they've worked it out, the formula, so that, you know, I think he gives the the calculations that roughly they only have to work like three hours a day. And then the rest of it, they're spent in festivities, rituals, leisure, quote unquote, largely speaking, right? And his point being too that the real work is clearing out the forest for planting. Whereas the hunters, when they go off hunting at night, they think of that as pleasure. That's not even work to them. Um, Gamification almost. And it's also a gaining of prestige. Like, as we said, that too, you know, you know, proving ones, et cetera, the songs, but also proving one's worth by bringing back game to distribute outside of one's, one's own use. It means that you're an essential member of society. No more nor less. And if you can't do that, then you become Pane, you become cursed, right. and you potentially have to become woman. That's one line of flight to literally become woman. And or you're stuck in that in-between zone that's so anxious for the other for the other guy who's kind of in, he's not man, not woman. And that's not where you want to be. Since you mentioned technology, could you clarify the discussion of the metal axe? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I forget I, which tribe it is relative to, but there was something very interesting about Vigler. Remember, like there's a destabilizing element to it. Yes, but also, it is. also in the way that they conceive of technology was different as far as it wasn't about how much more we could accumulate right. the larger surplus that could be accumulated. It was about the having more, I guess, leisure time or something. Yeah. So I don't think we're given the tribe name. But this is 196 and 197. He says, the advantage of a metal axe over a stone axe is too obvious to require much discussion, <laughs> except that it's not the reason to have them. It's, it's the consequences that needs discussion. Right. Yeah. So one could do perhaps 10 times as much work with the metal axe in the same amount of time as with the stone axe or else complete the same amount of work in one tenth of time. When the Indians discovered the productive superiority of the white men's axes, they wanted them not in order to produce more in the same amount of time, but to produce as much, so they didn't want a surplus, but produce as much in a period of 10 times shorter. So they wanted more leisure time. They wanted, that's their affluence, not the surplus value of accumulation. You know, what's interesting Uh, here too, is that this is, so this is, this is egoism too, right? Because it's not about creating a surplus. It's about... I mean, I'm trying to think how to say this properly, because, yeah, it's more like even though it has this collective element to it there at the level of ego or the level of the individual relative to surplus or free time, because the distinction being like in capital society, it's all about accumulation for one or what have you. Whenever you think about continual um, growth, for right, example, or like someone like, um, you know, quarterly growth. Uh, yeah. Or. Even someone like like a Bill Gates, why do you keep accumulating that sort of that defeats the, the purpose is free time or something or leisure, right? So once you've amassed this sort of, it's sort of pointless if you are thinking in terms of uh, self-interest. Right. You're sort of captured by 
this whatever you want to consider capitalism, I guess, or like accumulation, this sort of drive to accumulation. Yeah, so they they get the metal axes because they want to do just as much work, but they want to do it in less time. That makes sense, right? It's what, you know, communalism is, is free time and nothing else or something like that, right? But he says exactly the opposite occurred. For with the metal axes, the violence, the force, the power which the civilized newcomers brought to bear on the savages create havoc in the primitive Indian world. Now, he doesn't go expand on that in this page. In the next page, I think he gives us a clue. But just by extrapolation, I would conjecture that one of the things they do when they start trading with the evil whites, as they're called, as the women sing the plaintiffs of, they sing plaintiffs about death and sickness, but also the evil whites, is now they are caught up in these extrinsic relations with the whites who can, who are the looming threat or one of the looming threats of exploitation, etc. Or at least even their values could corrupt and infect them. But on the next page, he says, so he's talking about how for primitive societies, the quote unquote economy is non-autonomous. I think this is interesting, right? Because he'll say that it's politics that spawns, it's the political that spawns the economic. So he says, uh, it is when the dimension of the total social fact, that's the Mousian language, yeah. is constituted as an autonomous sphere that the notion of an economic anthropology appears justified when the refusal of work, when the refusal of work disappears, when the taste for accumulation replaces the sense of leisure, in a word, when the external force mentioned above makes its appearance in the social body, that's when the economic becomes instituted. So uh, the force without which the savages would never surrender their leisure, that force which destroys society insofar as primitive society is the power to compel. It is the power of coercion. It is political power. But economic anthropology is invalidated in any case. In a sense, it loses the object at the very moment it thinks it has grasped it. The economy becomes a political economy. So I think that's that's the havoc and destruction that the metal axes represents. Gotcha. Um, Which I think yeah. is interesting given doesn't I forget if this ties in directly to his critique of Engels and Marx as far as base superstructure is concerned. Oh, well, there's at least two critiques of Engels and Marx, if not more, but the two big ones, I think, and I know where you're going with this. The two big ones, I think, is first, they can explain the move from the barbaric despotic machine to the capitalist machine, but they have trouble and Classer doesn't say he solved everything. He's, he's still saying this is stuff we have to yeah. cogitate about, but here's my thoughts. But he's saying that they have trouble explaining this move from primitive societies to, to the despotic machine, to the state, if you yeah. will. They, they have trouble thinking the counter-state societies to state societies. This is part of the merit of anti-Oedipus. This is part of why he was singing Deleuze and Guattari's praises in that round table in flux, which is found in chaosophy, if you guys are interested. But the second one is what you're talking about. And let me see if we can find that. Yeah. So this is page 202. And his basic point is that sort of standard Marxian way of, of saying that societies change would be to look at their infrastructures, right? Their economic infrastructures. The example he's giving is can we look at the move from nomadic societies to agrarian societies as the big revolution that created the state? And he kind of problematizes this and says, you know, there were sedentary societies that weren't agrarian, for example, relying on fishing. We could think of, you know, certain Eskimo societies or certain island societies, for example, right, that would have that would have been able to be sedentary and not necessarily had to be agrarian. Basically says that uh, they just basically had no need of it, right? So he says, in other words, as regards primitive societies, transformation at the level of what Marx has termed the economic in infrastructure is not necessarily, quote unquote, reflected in its corollary, 
the political superstructure since the latter appears to be independent of its material base. That was a big phrase, but his main thing is certain nomads or certain hunters and gatherers may be nomadic, but they also could have been sedentary. They could have been sedentary and vice versa. They could have different infrastructures, but the same superstructure. They could have the same infrastructure, but different superstructures. And so he makes this kind of interesting claim. He's like, Perhaps, and if one wants to preserve these concepts of infra and super, then perhaps one must acknowledge that the infrastructure is the political and the superstructure is the economic. And I think that that's a provocative reversal that would and should generate a lot of debate, at least with just in terms of classical Marxism. Right. Yeah, I thought that was interesting, too, because he specifically says, just to like put a finer point on it, he says that they can show... I think they can show barbarism to, to modern economics, but can't figure out this transition from primitive societies to barbarism or barbarians or primitive to barbarian. That transition is muddied or one that I guess Marx and Engels can't quite, as you kind of just described, they can't quite put a bow on that. Right. I forget exactly how he says it. Because he also referenced, because Marx references the Asiatic mode of production as a contrast as yes. part of this too, which I can probably search Asi- Asiatic to get that quote really easily. Yeah, while you look for that, I think what I like about his positive definition of subsistence economy is that it is compatible with the substantial limitation of the time given to productive activities. So just as an aside, while you search, it's basically this notion that the positivity of subsistence societies is precisely that they aren't these societies of production for production's sake, right? For, for accumulation, for massive growth, et cetera. It might've been in that quote that you shared, actually. I feel like it's in one of the, but I recall seeing it specifically Asiatic being referenced, but from like, maybe it was from the Guatari. Asia and Asiatic are nowhere to be found in the text. Apparently. Yeah, I don't think he references Asiatic mode of production. He may- Where the fuck I think did, I, the, where the fuck did I read that? that? No, you're thinking I know I did. Of, no, primitive accumulation isn't coming. Okay. Here. All right. That's the last part of Capital Volume 1. So, And anyway, the, the positive definition of subsistence also refers to a refusal of a useless excess. I think that's an interesting thing, right? That There has to be sort of an instrumentality or a utility to everything, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Here, yeah, it's in the quote from that you tweeted earlier yeah okay is this a return to an evolutionist interpretation of history a return to marx beyond morgan not at all marxism kind of found its way to the barbarians the asiatic mode of production but never quite knew what to do with the savages why because if in the marxist perspective the passage from barbarism oriental despotism or feudalism to civilization capitalism is thinkable on the other hand allows one to think of the passage from savagery to barbarism. There is nothing in territorial machines, primitive societies that would allow one to say that it anticipates what will come after. No caste system, no class system, no exploitation, not even by work, if work by essence is alienated. So where does history, class struggle, deterritorialization, et cetera, come from? The Les Guattari answer this question for they do know what to make of the savages. And their answer is, in my view, the most vigorous most rigorous discovery in anti-Oedipus, it concerns the theory of the Erstat, the cold monster, the nightmare, the state, which is the same everywhere and which has always existed. Yes, the state exists in primitive societies, even in the tiniest band of nomad hunters. It exists, but it is constantly being warded off. It is constantly being prevented from becoming a reality. A primitive society is a society that devotes all its efforts to preventing the chief from becoming a chief, and that can go as far as murder. If history is the history of class struggles, in societies where there are classes, of course, then one can say that the history of class of society is the history of their struggle against the latent state. It's the history of their effort to encode the flux of power. And I think we can kind of leave it there for now, right? Would you agree? Yeah. You know, um, that's basically what... That's kind of what you were saying too, I think. Yeah. Just that, that, that those are the two kind of, I'll just say minimal critiques of Marx and, and trying to say 
in a way what he's getting at right that why in a way it's kind of saying why why ethnology is important if it's and because it's important it needs to ward off these ethnocentric presuppositions that's obviously key we've talked about some of them evolutionism technological supremacy you know these kind of things defining primitive societies by way of lack negatively all these things that in their own way kind of link up with with Leotard and Baudrillard and obviously Antiochus. Maybe moving to the discussion of of writing on the body. Yeah, the, the torture something. essay. I feel like that's another <clears throat> big the torture essay component that would have nice tie-ins to uh Antiochus. Oh, it, yeah, and, and and it's quoted from in Antiochus. So we should definitely look at that. So this is the penultimate essay of torture in primitive societies. The very first page of the essay is amazing and starts with a bang. I think it was kind of cool that he quotes Kafka. I mean, yeah, this he is... quotes Kafka, the penal colony in the penal colony. I'm curious as to whether this is, is he picking this up from Deleuze and Guattari or is this his own in- independent? It's um, tough to say, I guess. No, I would assume that he would have. Um, Minor literature hadn't come out yet. No, it hadn't. But. No, I, I would assume it would have been some of his own his own work. But he talks about how, let's see, here Kafka designates the body as a writing surface, a surface suited for receiving the legible text of the law. And if it objected that something merely invented by a writer's imagination cannot be applied to the domain of social facts, the reply can be made that the Kafkaian delirium seems in this case somewhat anticipatory and that literary fiction prefigures. Prefigures the most contemporary reality. And then he quotes from testimony about what happens in the USSR and and some of the camps in the 60s about these, this writing of the prisoners on their bodies. And Kafka, Kafka is a writing machine, right? That like stamps them with their crime, right? Obey your superiors and shit like that. And the examples he gives of, of the USSR, the prisoners are supposedly writing on their own bodies. And he gives these examples as a way to to sort of contrast the extremes of how the body is written upon and marked in primitive societies. Yeah. In primitive societies, here's how, here's what the writing on the body, the marking of the body signifies and how it works. And right before he mentions Kafka in that first section, the first page, he says some beautiful things. He says, uh, No one is meant to forget the severity of the law. Various means have been devised, depending on the epic and the society, for keeping the memory of that severity ever fresh. For us, the simplest and most recent was the generalization of free and compulsory schooling. Once universal education became legislated fact, no one could, without lying, without transgressing, plead ignorance. For in its severity, the law is at the same time writing. Writing is on the side of the law. Hence, all law is written. All writing is an index of law. That stuff about compulsory universal education, very much in line with what Guattari says in um, Machinic Unconscious, which we've discussed, which is basically that no one's supposed to be ignorant of the law, failing which they will be institutionalized or they will be readapted, right? They will be re-educated. And, you know, he begins the first essay of this book, Copernicus and the Savages, by, by quoting Nietzsche, and one can't fail to think that the whole meditation on, on the second essay of the genealogy of morals is about how the body of the criminal or the or just really the body of prehistoric man is like meant to remember debt and pain is the means by which this occurs, pain on the body. And we'll we'll get to that when we when we do Antiochus chapter three. Well, isn't there something about something like that reference elsewhere as far as the torture goes i forget who he's quoting but he's quoting this either an ethnologist or a missionary and this guy is white guy he's witnessing these initiation rituals right yeah, and he's describing what painful yeah yeah he's describing with horror like oh my god they're and he cried and wept yeah because of the but basically what what it boils down to is that Primitive societies mark the body, right? Or something like that. And the marking of the body is related to these excruciating 
rituals. You know, I was reminding of, of Brave New World and how John is uh, so upset that he's not able to participate in the the young adult males with the young adult males in their their whipping ceremonies. Right. He's left out of that. He's not allowed because he's a he's a gringo. He's a white guy. Anyway, what yeah, we he's see, sort of like he's sort of like that figure of the that ha- he has a, sort of the Pawnee almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, scenario. he's. He's included, but he doesn't he's in, belong. in, but not of. Yeah, right. Yeah, in, he's included, but doesn't belong. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. But we see that the part that they quote in Anti Oedipus, in order to say that there is an eye that extracts a surplus value, whether it be pleasure or whatever it is, because Nietzsche asks this question: How can a debt owed be made good by a pain given? Like, what's the quantitative equation? And it's obviously an eye that extracts a surplus value of of code, so to speak. The thing they quote, this is from page 183, section five on torture and memory. The initiators make certain that the intensity of the suffering is pushed to its highest point. Among the gaiaki, for for instance, a bamboo knife would be more than sufficient to slice into the skin of the initiates, but it it would not be sufficiently painful. Consequently, a stone must be used with something of an edge, but not too sharp. A stone that tears instead of cutting. So a man with the practice eye, and this is what they focus on in Antiochus. So a man with the practice eye goes off to explore certain stream beds where these torturing stones are found. And that's just one example. But one other thing that's marked in the initiation ceremony, because the women are initiated too at the age of menstruation, right? They have to bear the some of the society's tattoo on their face, and on their skin with these primitive thorns and, and needles, right? Yeah, like um, stick and poke type yeah. tattooing. And we get a nice quote from from the elder woman who's, you know, who's having to tattoo this this girl that's squeamish and, and yelling. And she and she's like, You're not worthy of, you know, yeah. what hunter would, would what what man would take you? You're a wimp, right? You're a pussy. You're not you're not worthy of of the best men. But from what he boils it down to is all the men, all the young men that go through the initiation ceremony are submitting willfully. They're consenting in their silence in the pain that they endure to law, right? That the law of the collective, and it's what every other man had to go through, right? So they're they're not going to cheat, and they're not going to um, they're not going to have it be any less than what anybody else went through. So it's the, he says it's, it's a desire to be faithful to the law. It's not some kind of masochism because the body itself is like an inscription surface that you carry along with you, right? That's the, that's the memory. Obviously, memento we've, we've discussed and that kind of plays in here. But um, the law inscribed on bodies expresses primitive society's refusal to run the risk of division. The risk of a power separate from society itself, a power that would escape its control. Primitive law cruelly taught is a prohibition of inequality that each person will remember. The law they come to know in pain is a law of primitive society which says to everyone, you are worth no more than anyone else. You are worth no less than anyone else. You know, last week we were talking about circumcision Mm -hmm. yeah, as a marking of the body too. Certainly with Israel being, being considered a tribe as well. And that right. being a certain, maybe that, you know, that could even be the sort of an antiquity or even among the Israelites, perhaps like sure. an antiquity, like, you know what I mean? Sort sure. of passed down or whatever, like, you know how those sort of things evolve, right? Well, it is, it's a covenant of memory. And the law too, right? Like I forget well, and what the, the law, what's the yeah. covenant relative to the Judaic law is the circumcision. Well, there's a bunch of them, but this is literally on the body. This is literally Inscribed, for all males. Yeah. Right. It's a way of remembering that, you know, what God promises when he enters, when Abraham enters the covenant is like your, your seed will outnumber the, the stars, right? That Abraham has been so faithful and good and patient for his son that this seems like a, like too much to like a dream come true, really. Right. So the covenant is, is a bearing witness. It's a testimony so you're right yeah it's it's a it's an inscription it's just a different form right i mean different strokes for different collective folks 
Yeah. Nice. I mean, in that quote, though, too, I, I really like this bit that's in italics relative to the camps in the USSR. It is the prisoner who himself who is transformed into a machine for writing the law and who inscribes it on his own body. I don't know if that has any relevance to that kind of desiring your own, the right quote about the masses desiring their own repression. Well, it's literally an internalization of, of the state form, right? I mean, it's, it's inescapable, right? It's, it's kind of branding. And even just pop culture wise, I think it's kind of interesting too, to think about that. What's the movie uh, Eastern Promises? Yes, because I think maybe this is a tradition that has been like continued, right? You always see the Russian sort of the Russian mafia and what, you know what I mean? Kind of the criminals have all the tattoos and the different tattoos that denote different things and so forth. Tattoos have also been a part of hierarchized societies too. Yeah. Yeah. Not just to, right. Because if you take that precept seriously, with what Claster says that the marking the inscription with the initiation and the pain undergone, if the precept is you are worth no more nor no less than anyone else, right? This is ex- warding off inequality, which already brings to mind like Rousseau's, you know, discourse on the origin of inequality. Then we can think that kind of like, kind of like Deleuze's ontology, which is like flat, and horizontal, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. Claster has is kind of envisioning, whether romantically or not, this notion of a kind of horizontal society. And this goes to this goes to the the duty to speak, the very short essay, which is about the the chieftain's power as a non coercive power. It's like a it's a non power insofar as we already think of power as coercion, as command, as obedience, whereas the chief's role as a mediator. We read all of these these ways of inscribing and circumscribing the the chieftain, and he's even talked about as as the society's uh, prisoner, right? Yeah. He, he's got he's got the he's kind of has a um, he's very much the kind of Christ figure, you know, when Christ tells the rich man to to give up all your belongings and follow me. There's something like that that the the society, as Christ is telling the chief, the rich man, you have to give everything up. You have to have this kind of charitable generosity. And even find in ingenious ways and new ways to like bring these gifts to to the society. It's interesting that way of uh, it's, it's a kind of chosen poverty, and the obligation too is not just a generosity; it's a generosity of speech, right? There's an obligation to give a speech that doesn't command, and, and that at best the the society around feigns inattention to. You know, all this kind of stuff is a way of instituting a kind of rigid horizontal equality. And the only exceptions, I mean, we had that one exception of the Pane, Mm -hmm. right? Which is a kind of you are included, but you don't belong to the to the men or the women, right? You're you're kind of in this hazy zone. So you could kind of modify the precept about not being worth what more or less it's, you know, because there is this demand on the, at least in the Gyaki tribe that he's describing many of the times, it's not the only tribe he describes, but the, insofar as their main source of food is from game and hunting, you know, this, this fear of not providing for the benefit of society is a yeah. very real, is a very real one. Right. You yeah, know, that so sense. that, so you have that pain is to remind you maybe you had a bad hunt, but you can't give in to that notion of Pane. And obviously this kind of accursed, accursed man did, you know, he, he accepted, he, he fell prey to that, to that curse. Cause obviously the curse isn't anything real bar- barring, you know, the prohibitions they have of warding off the curse. He kind of has accepted that. No, I'm fuck, I'm cursed. I'm cursed. So an internalization of the prisoner mindset or whatever yeah position yeah. he allowed himself to become like a victim so to speak whether it be his mourning for his lost wife right we know he's a widower that's mm-hmm. like one of the few things we learn about him perhaps that's that's the kind of mourning and melancholia the, the the depression that he went into that is well i lost my wife so obviously i'm a you know obviously i'm cursed right it's it's who knows kind Not- of interesting on this same discussion of the prisoners was how there was the line about 
they wouldn't tell the prisoner what was going to happen to him. And they were, it was something that it was a really interesting line. It was, well, it, it doesn't matter. He'll, his body will find out. Yes. We don't, that's, we don't that's inform, the Kafka. Yeah. Yeah. We don't inform the prisoner. The body will soon know. Yeah. Or something like that. Kafka esque. <laughs> I, I suppose when this was translated, Kafka esque hadn't become as a, one of those SAT words because yeah. Kafka, Kafkaian doesn't really. Right. Just, just a, doesn't hit the spot. Man. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was. I noticed that too. This almost made me think, had me thinking about like in the kind of Landian CCRU way that of viewing like capitalism as, as a demon or something, or as like an entity that's, that's like unleashed. There's some Western civilization or whatever, like way back that where they like disturb some urn or some shit and unleash this force. Talking about when somebody 80,000 years ago kicked over a... Yeah, 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 yeah. That was kind of... That was definitely what I was was referencing. You know what I mean? But Clasters talks about how this power escapes... It almost escapes society's control. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't say that about capitalism, but he just talks about the way that power sort of... uh, This methodology of warding off power from escaping society, in a sense. Right. I mean, this is the conundrum he's left with, still pondering at the end of the the book, this notion that the real locus of power is society, that the locus of power is not vested in the chiefs. And he only gives us a couple of indications for how it could come about. And part of it does seem to be demographic, but he he doesn't think that that alone solves the problem. The other part seems to be, and it's so tantalizing because he doesn't say too much about it, even though there are other pieces in the book that talk around it and about it, Mm -hmm. is this question of the prophet and the prophet speech versus the chieftain speech. And if the chieftain speech is always already thought of as, as an empty speech insofar as it doesn't command and it doesn't even really have a signification, right? He's kind of going over these rote things about even if it's beautiful words or whatever, it's the stuff about how our ancestors lived in harmony and they, we got to like stick with tradition, blah, blah, blah. The prophets have this full speech where they're like, we live in an evil land, right? We have to find the, the land without evil, this paradise. That's what we were meant for. And so that full speech is this promise of, of something that breaks with the tradition, right? That, as though the ancestors are always destined us for this. That's kind of the, I don't want to call it like sleight of hand or whatever, but that's at least, how is it? I mean, I I do think that in the smaller societies, you might have shamans, but the shamans themselves don't seem to participate or hold the same status as the prophets. He distinguishes clearly between the two, right? And they seem to have different functions. So how is it that one gets to the point of where prophets are necessary? I mean, we could go back to the, to the Old Testament again and talk about how so much of what the prophets warned the Israelites again is precisely about getting a king, right? And how that's, that's where they, that's where the evil lies, is literally setting up a state for themselves. And, you know, the majority of the middle of the Old Testament is, is really about this legacy of becoming a kingdom and some of the some of the shenanigans that follow from that. So, you know, I'm left with thinking about how the meditation of, um, I think it's apparatus of capture, but it could be the war machine where in a thousand plateaus in the treatise on nomadology, the war machine, Deleuze and Guattari talk about these two figures that another a French uh, guy named Dumazil. He looks at mythology and it's all about, it, it's, it's kind of like uh, he's looking at power and these other things in mythology and, and how you have, you kind of have a, um, you've got like, on the one hand, you've got the, the warrior God. And on the other hand, you've got kind of like the, the priest God and like the two of them conjoin even in their competition, but they can join. And that's kind of where, the state comes from. I, that's all I can kind of think about with what Claster is indicating at the end of the book with this struggle between the chieftain and the and the prophet. I was thinking too that Sterner and his ideas of the spook would have some sort a certain relevance here as far as like these, I don't know, in a way that these sort of ideas catch on or 
they sort of, I'm not sure how the best way to articulate it, but these sort of external labels or identities that one takes on. So like whatever one writes upon oneself, the way that these, the prisoners themselves, this example within the USSR of the prisoners inscribing themselves as prisoners, that has a certain a certain relationship to how Sterner kind of looks at things and spooks. And I just can't, I, I can't quite articulate that fully, but I don't know. There's something there. This question of being, you know, haunted by, by dead labor, right? That living labor is, is haunted by it. You know, it, it, Baudrillard's talked about it. Marx yeah. talks about it. This, right. The empty speech that I was talking about with, with, the Claster describes, you know, this going back to tradition, sticking with tradition, the ancestors kind of laid the foundation. You know, there is a sense in which there is a, that speech is, is kind of talking about, you could call it spooks, you could talk, you could call it ancestor worship, you could talk, you could call it whatever. I mean, Mouse himself, in his way of talking about prestations and counter prestations and, and the, this kind of cycle of gifts is all embedded in this question of uh the gifts we receive are, are haunted by these spirits yeah, right and that forces us to put them back into circulation lest their energy overwhelm us and kind of like the pawn a curse us right there yeah. is a sense in which that curse could be in, including death that forces us into the modes of exchange and also feeds into Claster's point about these prohibitions about i mean the whole reason why the hunters don't eat their own meat is because they won't be effective hunters afterwards. The prohibition says that, but the logic is about exchange and circularity. You could say the same yeah. thing about the spirits, right? This metaphysics of the spirits haunting the, the necklaces haunting the and, and, oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and the bracelets, right? That we have to set back into exchange or find ways of discharging that accumulation. It's not meant for us. Yeah, man, and, that's such a really, I wish I understood this much better because I think this dead labor shit is quite really interesting. Makes me wonder if there's some type of magical, in a sense, situation going on. Just understanding how dead labor does sort of haunt us and control us, etc. That's too, I think, what Sterner is sort of gesturing at too. Some of this Lacan would talk about in terms of the symbolic, right? Yeah. It pre-exists us. You know, one can think about how we're named before we're born, right? There's yeah, yeah. this little slot for us that we come into the world and obviously now with technology, you know, and potentially with the genetic uses and eugenic uses to which it can be put, you know, your parents could select your birth and your traits and all of this shit. That notion of language haunting being is kind of implicit in, in Lacan's notion of the symbolic, you know, that's, that's the question because like what, Claster has this, it's on the penultimate page of the book. It's on the, like the second to last page where he says, with the prophet comes this, and, and with the religious kind of worldview that already supposes the prophets, the prophets come in and exploit, is this notion that the one is the evil. Now that was and, really, I thought this was quite interesting to hear this come up in the book too. Yeah, that the one is the evil and it's the not one that's the good. Yeah. And of course, Claster makes the and it's it's questionable, but it, it fits in with his argument that the that the one is the state, right? And and the state is evilness. And so what's paradoxical is that even though the prophets seem to set into motion this movement whereby the state comes up, perhaps what they're fighting off in a way that the chieftain, as the society grows, can't fight off is the very presence of the one, i.e. the state. It may just be an unintended consequence that the prophets accelerate or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or discombobulate social forces in a way that inequality gets instituted. He makes this interesting reverse argument, which is how is it that Socrates and Plato, et cetera, Western society as we know it, make this equation of the one and the good? How does it come about if primitive societies, quote unquote, equate the one with the evil, how does that reversal come about? Yeah. And we find in the an most ancient philosophy, he doesn't even say Plato and Socrates, he says Heraclitus. Yeah, yeah. Who does say the one is the, the highest good. So how does that come about that, the, that in the West, we just, that therefore philosophy as a mode of discourse is... Damn. 
Damn. You know, it is 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 at least presupposing the state as well. Damn. So is this where non philosophy? Well, come in and or is that? I mean, obvi- <laughs> I mean, obviously for Laura Well, he's working. He's already working on. He That's where already, my head went. He would already. Was- he, yeah, he would already bracket the one and the good in, in, in any case, right? Gotcha. Okay. You know. That's but where it, my mind that, went immediately with this right. one and non one discussion. Just of course, because, you know it's like the uh, DiCaprio DiCaprio meme. Oh, there. Yeah. Like, oh, once again, yeah. right? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I did the same thing. I just think that you know, like Laura Wells' sources are is particularly Western philosophy in different conjunctures, and uh, I do think that he might find that you could easily make transpositions of the one being evil and the one being good, and those are you know, those ways of that binary is not in terms of non-philosophy, that binary description would equally be suspect and put into and suspended in terms of its sufficiency. But it does, it is this interesting move that Clasters makes just by kind of saying that if the one is the state and the one is evil, how is it? It kind of accords with everything we said with anti-Oedipus, with Reich, this notion that with Plato and Socrates, we see that, you know, he was the whole problem was the the way in which they rejected Athenian democracy, their form of equality, quote unquote, mm-hmm. and wanted this return of tyrants, this return of of a form of of power that was much more hierarchized and much more much more like the despotic machine, right? So a much more, at the very least, much more unequal society. Let's just yeah. say, how is that the highest good? That's kind of what Clasters is doing there. Again, I know he he's, he quotes he brings in Heraclitus because to bring in Plato and Socrates is is way too much. It would have way too much baggage. I think with Heraclitus being less having less biographical information about him and the and his politics and stuff, right, it's an right, easier right. it's an easier and an earlier reference. But yeah, I mean Socrates and Plato both have these kind of fascistic streaks. I know that it's anachronistic to call them fascist, but they're proto-fascist or they're pro-tyrant, if you will. Pro-philosopher king, right? That's the interesting thing to me, right? Is that when the one is is the good. It's funny because you see that the way that uh, there's a fetishization of the logic and reason cloud, like the Ben Shapiro kind of thing. And what they want is the philosopher king, right? Ultimately weighing out this binary of right and wrong and good and bad, etc. There are still unironic traditional monarchists and all that. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Moldbug as well. It's the idea that one man is more effective, more decisive, less flawed than collective, than a collective will. And I think the Clasters asks a much more interesting question. When yeah. he shows the chief to not be a kinglet, right? As as he's described by the, yeah, he's like li- the, he's like a literal civil servant. What one would think is the ideal civil servant, right? You know, even politicians, even in our day, right, are referred to civil servant or something like that, or people that are involved in the bu- bureaucracy, right, are labeled civil servant. He literally says it's the servant of society, the the society's prisoner. Yeah, that's kind of how he says it. It's, it, it's interesting. interesting that in some of the other tribes, like in Copernicus and Savages and Exchange in Power, I think Exchange in Power, he's working with these different cultures. The norm is for the chief to have multiple wives. And it's almost like that's the only real compensation he gets yeah. for his unending generosity, his possessing very little his obligation to speak, his lack of power in the traditional sense, in the modern sense of coercion, coercion yeah, yeah. where he's the mediator and where his, uh, his position, because he doesn't have authority in the sense, again, as we would think of it, but his position is, is easily revoked if he were to try to act on that authority. That's, that's how he's, he's prisoner. And yeah. so with the prestige of the chieftainship comes the sacrifice of power. Whereas we would equate prestige and power more in uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in our societies. So Clasters does a lot of these things where he is he is taking these complementary pairs, these binaries, and he's reshuffling them around and showing them to, to mirror 
a lot of our ethnocentric conceptions, a lot of the what he calls the kind of our conceptual poverty. He's able to do this by playing on these binaries in ways that are very uh, convincing, at least. Yeah. Now, I would say that even within our extraordinarily hierarchized society, some of this stuff still applies to leaders. Okay. Now, I mentioned this relative to Trump in particular because he was the, the, but I mean, he's not the only, right? Like there's a certain, and I think maybe in particular, maybe this is just a, a happenstance or coincidence of, right? Because like there is a certain ridicule like presidents are ridiculed. Um, Now this wasn't so much the classic Saturday night live thing of impersonating the president, right? That goes back quite a while, but who was the most ridiculed president in our lifetime was probably W before Trump, at least. Nixon, Reagan, W, Trump. I mean, Clinton got pretty good because of Lewinsky. But he's less the buffoon, whereas I think Trump true, true. Trump is like the buffoon, takes on the position of the buffoon. W had the sort of buffoonery like this, which is, and they're sort of trapped as well. In a sense, they have tremendous power, but they also don't. The commander in chief, that goes back to the chief having, even within the societies that Clasters mentions, that has certain powers within wartime of coercion, right? The like during well, that time uh, of during see, military that's, that's, campaigns, what, that's right? where it gets that's where it gets interesting, right? Because it's like he's able to give commands and you could say it's coercive, but at the same time, he can't choose to go to war just on his own lonesome. Right. He yeah. still needs the society, specifically the men, to want to go to war. I mean, you had the you had the the note about Geronimo that he talks Apache, about at the end yeah. of the book, right? That Geronimo got revenge for against the, you know, a, a Mexican settlement, got revenge for retribution for what happened to one of their one of their tribes. And when he tried to keep that going, he didn't have support after his first success. So it is interesting, the parallels, though. But yes, that's the one exception that Cluster points out that that in times of war, that's when the chief potentially has power and he does seem to indicate that in certain societies the war chief could be a separate individual but it does seem like in most societies especially the smaller ones that it would be the 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 same right i thought it was a little bit interesting that that sort of dynamic is somewhat obviously in that specific example the president can't go to war by themselves but they don't they need the I guess well, the, the people, uh, Aqu- the, they need, they Congress don't need the, to use, they used to need Congress to go to right. war. They don't need, but even though they don't, they don't need Congress, they don't need the consent of the general public. They need the consent of at least the, a certain class, like yeah, if I certain mean, class right. interests weren't met sure. or whatever in the hierarchy, then that sort of, I guess, dissent can be generated, I suppose, which actually kind of brings me back to another aspect that I found quite interesting was that these situations, these conflicts that have no resolution could be manufactured to challenge the chief. Do you re- recall this? Yeah. I mean, what, uh, what, what passage are, are we thinking of? I know the gist of what you're talking about, just off the top of my head. The chief's power is, is so circumscribed that it is very contingent. And yeah he can risk losing it. And one of the ways he can risk losing it is by trying to act the chief as Claster says. Yeah. Chief who tries to act the chief. It's kind of Sartrean in a certain way. Right. The, but it would be more like the waiter who tries to be the waiter instead of limiting his role and acting it. I mean, so yeah, you could even like his failure to mediate conflict can put his, Power, power is yeah. Well, there was position, a line of his position in right uh, in threat, but it was it was like this kind of throwaway <laughs> line which he didn't really follow up too much. But it was about it would almost sort of the implication being that yeah, you could sort of almost like the power could be thwarted by or if you had a usurper or something like that, that may it was almost like there there could be these manufactured conflicts to threaten the chief's power, right. 
sort of like if you come up with a problem, almost like COVID, right, is a, kind of an example of this in the sense of this is a problem that the chief could not solve, right? If you're thinking about this in terms of the manufactured crisis, crises to challenge the authority of the chief, but I guess if the chief doesn't have authority, that metaphor kind of falls apart. Yeah, I mean, but it, it still seems like he's not just a mediator, he's also a problem solver. Right. And if he fails to solve the problems before him, it does seem like the, the tribe has the freedom to fall in with another leader or even, a, or even merge with allied tribes and yeah. nations. The way that it was written, it sort of implied that this could be carried out by members of the, there could be this sort of usurpation of the yeah, chief. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Through I mean, manufactured crisis. Right, through manufactured crisis or, or, you know, like there was a point or two where I thought of Totem and Taboo, right? The, the band of brothers ganging up on the primordial yeah, exactly. father. Yeah, exactly. Kind of that same, yeah. That same but the problem like is like the Freud's way of describing it is completely foreign to what Clasters is describing. Because the even though in, in some of the societies he's describing that the chieftain usually reserves the role of, of having multiple wives, even he mentions a famous chieftain that had 200 or whatever in a very large tribe. It doesn't seem like the description of the primordial father hoarding all the women and all the goods fits with... Actually plays itself out, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it accords with what Clasters is describing and observe. That fantasy or that scenario that Freud concocts, because it is a speculative anthropology that Freud's dipping into, is, is feeding into his, you know, for example, we start off with talking about the diagram of sexuation. It feeds right into that masculine side yeah, of yeah. castration, castration. Yeah. and the, inherent, the, the inheritance of that phylogenetically. Yeah, through and, the father. So Glaster shows that that's that kind of myth doesn't seem to have really any evidence that we know of. Yeah. But it's still a, a nice myth explanatorily, but it's, mm-hmm. just, it's just not. Now, on the other hand, I mean, like, I'm, it makes me think about this question of animal societies and like, uh, you know, the lions, the head honcho line and the pride, right? Fucking Scar and Mufasa and stuff like that. You know, these kind of stories we tell, whether or not he indicated that there could be manufactured crises to unseat the chieftain, it's highly logical that that's possible. I'm sure mm-hmm. there's always there's always been conniving assholes in, <laughs> in history, right? But in all the things that we've discussed today, Classer keeps coming back to this point that they're, that on multiple fronts and not just the role of the chief, along with the other prohibitions about polyandry, for example, and, and not eating ones on hunt. All of these things are the ritual torture and, and the inscription of the body. You know, all of these things are in place. It's not just one mechanism, so to speak, that, that wards off inequality and, so to speak, wards off the state. In A Thousand Plateaus, they talk about Plaster's, some of his other work, too, where they're working through this notion that when tribes fight, it's as though they are fighting in order to ward off the, the necessary accumulation of power for any one tribe to have the power to, to, to erect the state. Oh, yeah. But, you know, the way that Clasters describes it is whether it comes from within and from without, it seems like there is this precognizance that the decoding of flows, for example, will or the overcoding that that shadows them on all sides that there is it seems like the the primitive societies are warding off what they what they fear like they have this knowledge beforehand right which um, is quite interesting you know Deleuze and Guattari kind of say this is a type of idealism if it if it foregoes archaeological evidence too as I said earlier but mm-hmm. but they are very in anti oedipus they're very much in line with this notion that if, like what Leotard says, right, like all societies are capitalist or there's no primitive society, all societies are capitalist. Like for Deleuze and Guattari, it's just that only insofar as it's the negative of primitive societies, right? Primitive territorial machine is, is what it's anxious about and concerned about is letting a flow escape that wouldn't be coded and that could potentially lead down this 
path that we're on of right. the reign of decoded flows, right? The spooks, you know? the dang spooks. I mean, you talked a oh. little bit about this <laughs> earlier, but coming from someone who's sympathetic to anarchism, I mean, aside from just loving the general tenor of the book in that way, I love this idea about power preceding lab- labor and yeah. alienation being political before it's economic. What could be more anarchistic than that sort of relation, especially when contrasted to Marxism? Yeah, I mean, the way that he describes, as we talked about, the three-hour workday and um, not desiring this excess, this useless surplus. Yeah. Right? If there is a surplus, it is for the necessary growth the to reduce the workday, yeah. not to increase it in a way that would, as I said, provide quarterly growth and, and yeah. this kind of exponential way that that's just kind of foreign to their mode of production. Which kind of goes to Baudrillard as well in the sense of symbolic exchange or exchange of more, I guess, exchange of signs or signs being exchanged, use value, sign value, et cetera, right? Because like a lot of the production that we have today is more focused on, there's not a use value per se with a lot of what gets produced. It is this excessive, we're not it's not that we produce, and the crises that happen within capitalism are not because of underproduction. Right. It's from overproduction, overproducing. So it's collective waste surplus that is what causes the business cycle, which, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, at least traditionally what we've seen, yeah, it's, it's related to overproduction. We may see a difference in that with people quitting their jobs. You know, I mean, that's a possibility, although that there are ways in which there are easy ways in which that can be corrected. And it all comes down to in lieu of collective bargaining and, and these other me- mechanisms of unions, et cetera, if people are being paid a decent wage for the, the shitty labor that companies are asking for, that's kind of the company's problem, right? Yeah. So that is how dead labor haunts us in the accumulated dead labor of, of capital, right? Because we have, there can't be reciprocity, but because the ledgers already to so stacked in the deck of one side we're already like at this point the all the authority all the coercion all the dead labor is, has been allowed to pile up so high that it's almost it's impossible to overcome maybe that's sort of where this dead labor thing comes into play i mean i guess that is literally how it comes into play because dead labor is effectively capital right it would be a foundation for it yeah for its miraculous surplus value you know, that it would be a necessary precondition, that accumulation you're, you're referring to. I think that's, that's precisely Claster's kind of point is like, the main thing, there's only two scenarios to go from, a, from this primitive mode of positively reevaluated, as he says, subsistence thought of positively is like limitation to, to production, right? So overproduction isn't really a thing. So his main point is how... And this is this gets to your thing about power preceding labor, the political preceding the economic, this kind of thing. Because for him, the economic implies a mode whereby surplus is produced in order to in order to exploit, etc. The main thing is if, as a rule, as we've seen, all these different mechanisms are in place, including the chief, who would you would think would be the first to like try to garner all. Um, right. The surplus value, when in fact the society is a locus of power, and they demand the generosity from the 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 chief to where he says, "No more, I have no more to give." Right? His thing is there are only two options logically: either there is a desire for this economic transformation, mm-hmm. right, for there to be excess value, for there to be more work done, more uh, hours in the workday, more surplus value. Or it's in, or it comes from outside. That's the death from within, without that the primitive territorial machine is trying to ward off simultaneously. Whether it be the the barbarians at the gate coming to to take over and impose that mode, or that desire somehow arising from within, as you said, could be manufactured crises, could be whatever. And the fact that it could come from without is kind of paradoxical because. That means that it had to be a desire that arose from within somewhere else. Right. right? And that's where 
the accelerationist CCRU demon capital <laughs> comes into play, but we don't have to get all too crazy, but just to like, I don't so know. Memorial there were there, time wars. There, yeah, exactly. There were the time machine came back to the primitive. Well, capitalism. You know. Yeah, capitalism is uh, constructing itself from the future or some shit like that. Right. And that kind of Rocco's basilisk sort of notion. Some evil bizarro Marty McFly going back and, and this instead is of a, betting on the this is kind of and team. that's why that's why I say like this idea of cat like you know what I mean some unwitting uh, homo sapien in a cave knocks over some fucking ancient urn set there by the deep ones that unleashes this state capitalist thing on us. Here's the thing. The primary logic, at least the capitalists use is self-interest and greed, right? You know, humans are by nature, by nature, greedy. Well, obviously that's not always the case in all times and all places as clusters clearly indicates. Otherwise the chiefs in these societies would. Yeah, they would. They would accumulate and, you know what I mean? He he has this beautiful quote, beautiful, I say beautiful, but also (laughs) horrifying. He says, basically, you may have to look for it, but his main thing is, well, first, even if prestige is gained in in the warfaring, he says, like, the society has a short memory, right? So it's never, prestige that comes with victory in war is never converted into authority. And... He's asking this question, how could how could the chief in service of the tribe somehow twist things around so that the tribe is in service of the chief? Where does that fascism come from? Right. Where does yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Where, where do the masses desire, right. uh, you know, this new mode of production? Precisely. Uh, the real question I want or the real quote I wanted to say is like he makes this point where why would someone want to usurp all of the surplus value for themselves, private property, quote unquote, and be in the midst of those without property. How would that just happen spontaneously? Which is precisely kind of Marx's, uh, you know, when, when Marx first praises Proudhon, it's this notion that he's the first to kind of not accept that private property is the natural foundation of political property economy. Theft. Just that there has to be a way of thinking through how does property become private? You can't start from that. And that in Claster kind of says the same thing. Like how, how would, and he himself just says like, it would be quite futile to search for the cause of the event of the state, for example, or mm-hmm. private property or of this transformation we're talking about in a hypothetical modification of the relations of production in primitive society. This is his continuation of his, maybe, maybe the superstructure is, the economic and the infrastructure is political, right? In these yeah. ways of looking at things. This is on page 199. All the foregoing is expressed at the level of economic life by the refusal of primitive societies to allow work and production to engulf them, by the decision to restrict supplies to socio political needs, by the intrinsic impossibility of competition. The side note is what I remembered. In a primitive society, what would be the use of being a rich man in the midst of poor men? In short, yeah. by the prohibition, unstated but said nevertheless of inequality, and yeah, and, so it and, only makes it only makes yeah. sense if there are other rich people, which right or, or yeah, exactly. Where does that desire come to to be the one with all all the shit or most of the shit? And how, but but it's even it's even really Claster is trying to be cheeky here. I think it's even more like how is it that this prohibition against consuming one's kill, which ensures exchange. Right. How is it that the how is it that something like that and the related prohibitions lead one to sort of hypervalorize oneself? And this gets us back to the bow in the basket where it's like, is there a moment in the when the men singing in the night, the soloists and they're bumping up their ego, you know, like Matthew McConaughey and Wolf of Wall Street, you know, and they're, they're like beating their chest. And it's this moment where that crystallizes into the notion of these motherfuckers are beneath me. I am better than them. I mean, like that's how Rousseau thinks of it. They're singing around the fire and and then there's this moment of self-consciousness that erupts and where values, where people start ranking each other and hierarchies just like kind of crystallize out of, out of nowhere due to, due to the rankings of prestige and ability and yada, yada, yada. I mean, is there that moment 
that just spontaneously happens. I mean, that's kind of how Guattari talks about the earth thought, right? It's just, it just, once it's there, it's like it had always been there. Mm-hmm. And to the effect that it had, has always been there. Deleuze says the same thing about language. Language doesn't come by adding pieces. It's all the piece, right? It, once it's there, it's, it's all there. Fully. So, yeah, I mean, it's, hmm. that's the discontinuity that Clasters is wanting us to think. and doesn't necessarily think all the way through. He's, he's trying to give us these means of kind of these meditations on thinking through this. But his, his attack against evolutionism means you can't, you can't be satisfied with thinking there is this natural continuity from primitive societies to, yeah, exactly. to state societies. That's an ethnocentric way of thinking. And that's also an illogical way of thinking. And it simplifies things too much. Yeah. And it's that gap that we, that one has to struggle with thinking. That's part of the last few chapters of a thousand plateaus is thinking about in the meditations on nomadology, war machine, apparatus capture is how, how does, how does this, this monstrosity occur? Over but that's also, that's also what we'll see in their meditations on Oedipus in, in chapter three of anti-Oedipus, right? That's kind of what we're building up to is they're going to try to give us the pieces that get us the logic that shows how these different territorial machines work and how we get to a capitalist machine. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why Clasters was impressed by, you saw in the, the little um, round table, what, he's, what he says is like the biggest chapter is, chapter is three. on. Yeah, and it's, he's like, ethnologists would feel at home here. What's going on? What's ethnology doing? And this discourse that's supposedly about psychoanalysis and capitalism, that's supposedly about Freud and Marx. Why are we talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. ethnology? And so that's, I think, the excitement that we have to look forward to. Right. And I think just goes to show the, um, I don't know if you'd call it the rigorousness of Deleuze and Guattari, or like, I don't know, their sort of multipolar approach to, to these questions, which is quite interesting. They're drawing from literature, ethnology, et cetera, philosophy, analysis, all these different machines in the service of this critique or not critique but and political economy right? yeah political I mean, economy right yeah they're using this very diverse set of tools that i think is you know even semiology and semiotics as yeah. well too you yeah. know it's all it's all in there which i think is i don't know just you can't fault them for their rigorousness in that approach the interdisciplinary approach that they take relative to their understanding of the way that these syntheses operate within the social body yeah, it's interesting that Claster says if Deleuze and Guattari had just said, well, primitive societies work this way and capitalist societies work differently yeah. and vice versa, he said it, you wouldn't get beyond the most tedious comparativism. And what's interesting is how they articulate in the social machines that code, overcode, and decode how they work differently, how these different modes of society, these different socius's function differently and how there can be this sort of critical universal history based on the laws set forth by Marx as they, they kind of open the third chapter with, but you have to take this detour, this necessary detour through these ethnological and archeological uh, meditations. And I think that chapter three looks really the most like a thousand plateaus out of all the chapters. You could say chapter two is kind of like the second plateau of one or several wolves, but as a whole, this third chapter we're going into is really like a, a nice, it's really to me, like we're going up this crescendo and it, and it's supposed to lead us to schizoanalysis. And that's like, that's like the exciting thing I think is nice. this is, is like, all right, now we're going to go through all of fucking history to finally get to how Oedipus gets grows out of a certain soil. And that will be necessary for understanding how capitalism works, understanding how schizophrenia is a, is a process. And that's what, and because Freud foreclosed that process, analysis has to shift, right, from the psyche to the skits. Very interesting. Do you feel like we covered pretty well what you wanted to get to today? I think so. I think what well, we're we've got to be close to two hours uh, yeah. in terms of raw material. 
I mean, the only other thing that I saw, there were some symbolic exchange type stuff, but I don't know if we necessarily need to go in that, you know, it might take, add too much time. So we can maybe I, table I, that a little bit, but I saw some of that too, but maybe we can, I'll try to note some more of that when we, when we get to chapter four, so we can kind of save that. There were some salient passages here and there re- related to uh, symbolic exchange. Yeah, that, that, that's what I meant. When we get to okay, chapter gotcha. four. Okay. We, yeah. I w- for some reason I was thinking uh, anti-Oedipus chapter four. Well, we were just talking about <laughs> anti-Oedipus. So, so yeah, once we move on to Bojir, I'll, we'll try to think back to, to some of, some of what we've read. I wrote JB on <laughs> at least like six or seven times, probably yeah. more. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> so we've, we've talked, a we've talked a lot about a lot of the salient points. I mean, um, you know, the, I think that the one thing just to reiterate is this notion about this coercive power versus non-coercive power. I think that's like the coercive power is obviously state, societies what we're familiar with and what he's what Deleuze and Guattari would call counter state societies societies against the state that would be non-coercive power but we already kind of talked about that with with the chieftain right who doesn't demand obedience in that case this will be the machinic unconscious happy hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins signing off for the week bye y'all the very rules of eating of negativity and singularity including the ultimate form of security, which is unconscious. Okay. The whole state of things, a pure violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. What I meant is the following. With nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, Lobotomized people, as in uh, block work orange.